Yeah, good morning. Would you uh, please take your Bibles out and turn to 1 Corinthians? This is an easy, this is an easy theme and an easy topic to talk about and to teach. It's difficult to let it sink in, right? But uh, what kinds of things make you feel like a fool? What kinds of things make you feel like an idiot? I've got a long list of those things, but one of them that comes to mind first is when I look someone directly in the face, and I'm supposed to know them, and I've probably known them all my life, and I call them the wrong name. I feel like such an, such an idiot for doing that. I was talking to my kids last night around the dinner table. The, the Bible calls us to follow Jesus in such a way that there are going to be times often when to continue to follow the Bible, you're going to look like an idiot. You're going to feel like a fool. The rest of the world is doing this thing, and you are going against the flow to do this thing. For example, even right now, the rest of the world says you should be working or jogging or mowing your grass. And yet you believe following Jesus means in the Bible it teaches you to be at church, a day of rest, a day of worship, a day of reflection. And that's why it stinks every Sunday you accidentally drive to Chick-fil-A going, I'm going to get some, oh, oh, I can't even get a chicken sandwich, even though I'm having a chicken sandwich emergency right now because of these fools who got to be losing money today. Maybe, maybe it's not all about the money. Maybe it's not all about the work. Right, other things in the Bible that you do, like, wow, this makes me feel like a fool. So if you're not careful, you can avoid those things. And you follow Jesus and all the stuff where it's okay with your culture, but this, the other stuff you just kind of leave off. Say, well, I'm doing pretty good. So this whole sermon series in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 4 invites us to become fools. Let's become fools for Christ. And that doesn't sound like an exciting thing. Because if I stood up here and got excited and said, let's go to PAX, you guys would say, let's go. That's a great idea. Or if I said, hey, let's go to Newtown Creamery, everybody said, that's a great idea. But when I have to read this passage, come to grips with it, and raise my arm and go, hey, let's all become fools for Christ, and everybody goes, yee, right, I'm still headed over to PAX. It's not an exciting proposition to do things and commit myself to a life that I'm uncomfortable with. So when you say, Pastor Trey, when you say, let's become fools for Christ, what do you mean by fools for Christ? So I've worked up a definition that's based on these passages, and I was hoping we could read this together today. There's two parts to the definition, so let's read the first part together. A fool for Christ is a person who has quit trying to win the approval of others in order to follow Jesus. That's plenty right there, isn't it? The second goes like this. A fool for Christ is a person, help me out, who follows Jesus with such madness that the rest of the world has labeled them, they're a lost, they're a lost cause. That guy is just a Bible-thumping obscurantist, fundamentalist, Jesus follower, and he's a lost cause. That guy is a fool. He'll just do whatever Jesus says. And the entire camp said, amen. That's what a fool for Christ is. That's our definition we're working with. And really it's based on two specific verses in 1 Corinthians. Now I want us to read these passages together, and maybe by the end of the series in September, we'll have this memorized. So would you stand with me in the honor of the reading of God's Word? And the first one comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. The second one comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So let's just read them one at a time out loud together. Here's the first one. If you think you are wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to be truly wise. Help me out with the reference. 1 Corinthians 3, 18. Here's the next one. Our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools. 1 Corinthians 4.10. That's why fools for Christ. Let's become fools for Christ. Before you're seated, 
You guys are all powerful and athletic. You can stand for a moment or two, right? Before you're seated, um, fools for Christ. Let me give you a couple examples. People who give, people who serve, people who live. These are fools for Christ. A person who gives financially, invests, especially you tithers that give 10% of your income to the local church and the mission and the kingdom of God, that's a fool. You could be making a car payment, or better yet, a boat payment, or better yet, a motorcycle payment. That's it. What idiot would do that? You're a fool. Person who gives, that's a fool. Person who serves, people who come to church not just to receive, but to give, serve, to work, to help, to reach others, people who serve in the local church, that's a fool. Why are you wasting your time doing that? Person who lives, person who lives by the Bible, believes what's in the Bible, puts it to practice in their life, constantly comparing your life to the Bible and thoughtful prayer, that's a fool. Why would, why would you do that? But the person who preaches about Jesus to others, let's admit, that's the biggest fool of them all. I mean, I don't care if you believe these things. It's okay if you want to waste your time and money, but can you just shut up about it? You going around talking about it, the sky is falling, you sound like an idiot. Stop talking about Jesus. Would you agree with me that the person who preaches about Jesus, that's the biggest fool of them all? Let's become one of those. Let's, be, let's become one one of those. Somebody say, whoa, wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. Let's become one of those. I want us to take a moment to pray, and I'm going to invite you to stand, sit, kneel, come to the front, whatever you want to do. Take a moment to pray, and I want us to pray like this today. Father God, help me to become a fool for Christ by preaching all over the room. Stand, sit, whatever you want to do. Kneel, come to the front, whatever you want to do. Let's take a moment I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to step back. And you just take a minute to pray, okay? All the people said, could I get one more person to pray for us out loud, please? One more person to voice our prayers.
Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. And as we get, we get started this uh, morning, I wanted to read to you a story about another fool. And if m- many of you should be getting this magazine at your house now, if you're not, uh, please see Jesse and Martha Stayer. They'll m- help you figure out how to. It's called Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, persecuted Christians around the world and articles that are just inspiring and here's the beginning of one that's called proclaiming the gospel in a prison nation Christians living in Eritrea located in the Horn of Africa along the Red Sea suffer some of the most horrific religious persecution occurring today the Eritrean government opposes and zealously persecutes believers who openly share their faith or worship outside state-approved churches Yet, even as thousands of Christians are killed, imprisoned, or forced to leave, Eritreans continue to place their faith in Christ, and everyone said. They are understanding that he alone is their hope amid desperate circumstances, and despite 16 years of oppression, many Christians in Eritrea have willingly paid the price for boldly and obediently proclaiming the gospel to their lost neighbors. Yamane gazed at the patch of sky visible through the opening in the ground some six feet above his head. His arms were bound behind him, and his throat was parched from hours without water. Although it was hard to gauge the time as he stared up at the light shining through the opening above, his previous detentions in the subterranean cell had ranged from 12 to 48 hours. Once again, Yamane was in the hole because he could not keep his faith to himself. And for the rest of the story, you need to get this issue of Voice of the Martyrs. Isn't it good to know there are people around the world who are willing to be put into a hole and kept there, put in prison, beaten, persecuted in different ways because they just won't shut up about Jesus? I think that's the biggest fool of them all. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 is our passage for today. We started in... Um, earlier this summer in chapter 1 verse 10 and uh, through 19 and then we took some time to finish up a series in Genesis and now we've come back and last week we looked at chapter 120 through the end of uh, chapter 1 today chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 and in this uh, in these verses the apostle Paul says mainly two main things about his own take on preaching and on foolishness and on the power of God. There are two main things that we're going to see in this passage today that I hope that we can take home with us. Let's begin. Chapter 2 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. When I came to you, I did not use lofty words. I did not use these words really grand rhetorical persuasive arguments when I told the testimony of God the story of God God's witness and what is God's witness Jesus Christ when I came to you to tell you that story from beginning to end that truth that good news about God's story when I came to do that I did not come to preach to you to show off a clever Paul I did not preach so that you would look up and go, wow, that Paul is so clever. I did not preach to show off a clever Paul. I didn't come using marketing gimmicks. I didn't come using subliminal messages. I I didn't come with even that kind of pandering to impress you and, and say nice things about you. I didn't come with any of that to show off how clever and smart I was to get you to join my fan club. I didn't come to you like that. I didn't preach to you like that. I didn't preach to show off a clever Paul. No, I preached to show off a crucified Jesus. And wouldn't you rather spend your time with your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones, talking to them about how clever you are, the awards you've won, the educations, the successes you've had? Wouldn't you rather spend time, and they'd probably you rather spend time doing that as well. But instead, you sit down and talk to them about something as offensive and silly as a crucified Jesus. But that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. Isn't that foolishness? He says, Paul says, I did not come 
to preach to you in a way that would show off how clever Paul is. I came to show off a crucified Jesus. Look with me in verse 2. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and what? And him crucified. Paul knows a lot of things, doesn't he, everyone? The Apostle Paul was a Ph.D. of his day. He studied. He was a smart guy. But when he came, he realized he was entering into a culture that loved rhetoric. They loved the best speaker, the cleverest speaker, the smartest sounding speaker. The guy, I mean, he's an, a person who's just a nerd, but can really communicate well because the Corinthians wanted to find that person and then get in their group. So they would say, hey, that Apollos, man, Apollos, that guy can speak. I had him over to my house, you know. You did? Yeah, I'm in his fan club. Who's fan? Well, I'm in Paul's fan club because of his content and his conviction. And there is other types. This, this was, people were really high on this in Corinth. And Paul says, you know, when I came, I realized that about you, and I didn't do any of that. I didn't do any of that. Because you and I might say, hey, you, maybe you should have. Because if we were on a university campus, maybe we'd speak to those people a little different a little differently than we would speak to a group of children. But the Apostle Paul says, you know, I just came to you, and I determined in my head, all I'm going to do is talk about Jesus and his crucifixion. That's all I'm going to do. Because I did not come to show off a clever Paul. Here's Paul. Isn't he great? Don't you love him? Don't you want to have him over for fried chicken? Here's Paul. I didn't come to do that. Instead, I came to lift up a crucified Jesus to show him off to you. I wanted you to see every part of this. You need to see. Well, I don't want to look at that. Look at it. Jesus was crucified. Look at this. Paul says, I did not come to show off a clever Paul. I came to show off a crucified Jesus. And notice that in verse 2, he says, basically, I have focused on two things. I emphasize two things, and here is the first. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ. Except Jesus Christ that Jesus is the Christ. Christ is English for the Greek word Christos, which means the anointed one, which is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew word Messiah, Mashiach, the anointed one, and that we know means the, the king, the savior king, that Jesus is the savior king. There's two parts of this, but the first one is this. I came to you saying, you know what? I could talk to these people about philosophy, I could talk to them using, trying my best to use the best rhetoric and convincing persuasion, but instead, I'm just going to kind of hold Jesus out there as the Christ. See how they do with that. I'm just, this is my strategy. I'm just going to go to them, and I'm not going to go to that level of kind of Greek philosophy. Instead, I'm just going to go and show them the story, the truth, that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior King, the Messiah. That's what I'm going to do. What if you and I became fools for Christ with a simple message? The world is broken and needs a Savior. It needs a Christ. It needs a Messiah. The world is broken by sin and it needs a Savior King. I think you could talk to just about anybody and they would agree with you that our world is broken. You guys are good. What do you guys think? I think most people would say, watch two minutes of the news and you'll realize that the world is broken. Now they have different views about that and what caused that and that kind of thing. But you and I both know that a biblical worldview says the world is broken and it's broken by sin. The world is broken by sin and that means that we need a rescuer. We need a hero. We need a savior. And Pastor Trey is not that savior. And he cannot save you. And the Apostle Paul says, look, Paul is not that Savior, and he cannot save you. Apollos is not that Savior, and he cannot save you. Aristotle is not that Savior, and he cannot save you. Your favorite TV preacher, radio preacher, is not that Savior, and he cannot save you. Paul says, I came to you with a simple message. Jesus is that Savior, and he can save you. He is the one hope for the world. That was my message when I came to you. I did not come to you to show off a clever Paul. I came to you to show off a crucified 
Jesus. And then he goes on to say this, verse 3. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. You ever heard those words used together in other places of the Bible? Fear and trembling is a common Old Testament catchphrase. Fear and trembling. Often used in terms of how we worship or come before the Lord, right? Come before Him, worship Him with fear and trembling. And you guys also know that the Apostle Paul used this in Philippians. He said, work out your own salvation with fear. And yet we still, Trey still tries to imagine a Christianity that rises above fear and trembling. And don't you just hope that there's some way of living life above fear and trembling? We pray against it. We work towards the point where we're no longer doing things with fear and trembling. Yet the Apostle Paul says, work out your salvation with. And here he says, when I came to you, I came speaking with fear and trembling. But he still spoke right? He still did it. He says, when I came to you, I came in weakness. I wasn't powerful. I wasn't uh, sophisticated. I wasn't this great rhetorician like these others. I was weak, and I did it in fear and in trembling. I don't know, maybe the great apostle Paul was intimidated by this group of people, but all he could do was, I'm scared, but I'm getting this message out to you, and I'm going to get out the content, even if my speaking part to the delivery is not very good. I'm going to get the content out to you. So he gets it out in weakness and fear and in much trembling. And he says, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. They, I did not stack up against the, the great rhetorical masters of our day. I did not. I knew I didn't. And I didn't come that way. But instead I came to demonstrate the Spirit and the power of God. What might God do even through something small and foolish and silly like my preaching? He could use plenty of other things. What, what might he do? You guys know it. The power of God was all around me even though I spoke to you with weakness. He, Paul says, look, I did not preach to you to show off my power. I didn't come speaking in such a way that you could say, wow, man, he, he told just the right joke at the right time, and wow, he had just the right hand gesture, and I noticed that he's, he did the right stomp with the right hand when he pointed out that way. When we did all these different little tricks, then, wow, he was persuasive, and man, I'm going to believe in that guy. The Apostle Paul says, I did not preach to show off my power. No, I preached in such a way to intentionally show off God's power. Because if I preach in weakness and little and my delivery really stinks, and it did, and please don't record that sermon that day. I don't want to listen to it again. It was awful. My delivery was awful. But you saw what happened. You Corinthians were there people's lives were changed people were con you were converted you saw signs and wonders and you're still baffled how is it that God's power could be going out being used a message being used that was delivered so awfully but the content was awesome but your delivery was so weak how is it that God was doing all those things it doesn't make sense well, the reason all this was intentional and the reason it was like that is so that for this goal in verse 5, so that in order that for the purpose that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men. And he means this sophisticated rhetoric. I don't want your faith to be in the fact that, well, I believe because Paul was a really great speaker. No, instead, Paul was not a great speaker. Instead, your faith is in the power of God because what you saw was God used a person who didn't speak all that well so that to do powerful things and you're looking at it and you're going wow only God God must have been at work Paul says I did not come to show off my power I came to preach in such a way as to show off God's power look back with me in verse 2 would you just for a second the apostle Paul said hey 
when I came, this was my strategy. When I came to you, and I know who you are and where you live there, I determined not to know anything among you. Just two things. That Jesus is the Christ, the Savior, and that he was crucified. Right? That he was crucified. In other words, when I came to you, I came with a very simple message. The message was this. The world is broken, and it needs a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. The world is broken by sin, and it needs a rescuer. It needs a savior king. Jesus is that rescuer. And he was crucified. Why is that important? Because the only way to pay for sins is through a life. Jesus was the only person who could give himself as a perfect sacrifice for our sins, so that if we believe on him, God's wrath passes over us, because he was punished for, the sin, for our sins in our place though he never sinned. Jesus was crucified. There had to be a crucifixion. There had to be a sacrifice. In other words, a simple message, as simple as this, the world is broken by sin, and it needs a Savior who will sacrifice himself for us. I can, I can lay down my life for, for someone, but I'm not the perfect sacrifice for sins because I'm sinful. We needed a Savior who perfectly obeyed God and then would sacrifice himself for the rest of us. Crucified. Isn't that a pretty simple message? Like, yeah, yeah, but can you just throw in some words? Throw in some really big sounding words, and then maybe it'll be cool and palatable to people, and they'll think you're smart, and then maybe you'll believe it. Well, no, that's not the strategy. That's not the strategy. Preach it so simple that a group of children would understand exactly what you're talking about. And then the smartest people in the room will probably miss it all together. But the ones the Holy Spirit is quietly whispering to, the ones who are aware of spiritual things, those people will get it. But the others, the, the, the brains in the room are probably going probably gonna to miss it. It's that simple. Paul says, when I came to you, look, I wasn't trying to show off how clever I was. I just wanted to show you that Jesus was crucified. When I came to you, I wasn't trying to show off my power. Look at me. Join my fan club. I was trying to show you God's power. How did I do that? by being weak. Somebody in this room say, I can be weak. Say, I can do that. It needs to be foolishly simple. Foolishly simple. Somebody say, I can do simple. I can do that. I can do that. Right? Two things. Tell the world that it is broken and needs a Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And that Savior needs to sacrifice himself for the rest of us. And that's exactly what Jesus did on the cross. 2,000 years ago. That's the message. And Paul says, you were there. Power was going on. You were converted. Hearts were changed. I can't change a heart. You can't change a heart. Only Jesus has the power to do that. Trey does not have the power to be sacrificed in your place. Paul does not have the power to save you. Apollos does not have the power to save you. Your favorite TV preacher does not have the power to sacrifice himself for the world. Only Jesus, the Savior, sacrificed himself to save the world. And somebody's already going, man, I'm bored. Where's the highfalutin stuff? Right? We're guilty of exactly what these folks were doing. Surely there must be some... Pastor, is there some way where you can complicate this and make it harder for us to understand, then we'll be impressed by it? Could you use Aramaic or Latin or something instead? Right? We go at Scripture. So if I'm having a hard time understanding this, there's probably a problem in the pulpit. This is simple. The message is simple. The Apostle Paul says, look, this is why I came. One message, content. Yes, it's big, but it's simple. You can, you can take 10 minutes to share it, two minutes to share it, or weeks to share this story with people, right? We need to be committed to all those things. The Apostle Paul says, look, that's why I came. I came to you in weakness, in fear, and much trembling, and look what God did. Does that encourage you? Somebody say, I can do that. I mean, there are fools for Christ in this room. And you come in a variety. 
But those of you who give, givers, people who give financially to the church, that's a fool. You could be using your money to go to Chick-fil-A except on Sundays. People who actually serve in the church, they're actually involved, those, those people. Why do, why do they waste their time doing that? That's a fool. Those folks who live by the Bible, even when it contradicts what they want, that's a fool. You just go live the way you want to live. Throw off this old religion. Just go live the way you want to live. That's a fool. But a person who goes around telling other people about Jesus, that's the biggest fool of them all. Let's become one of those fools. Somebody in the room says, look, I can't do that because I'm not smart enough. I, they're going to ask a question that I can't answer. Does this message encourage you today? Here's what you have to do. Here's your mission. Here's your challenge. Make it as simple as it can possibly be. Some might say, I can do simple. If they start asking lots of weird questions, just stick to the simple. Say, that's interesting, but listen, let me tell you this. And just stick to the central message. The world is broken by sin. It needs a Savior. Jesus is that Savior, and he died sacrificing himself for you. What are you going to do about that? These other questions, they're important. Go talk to people about that. But what are you going to do about that? That's what God expects of us. He expects of us simple. Somebody say, I can do simple. I was reflecting on something really theological and really spiritual and deep the other day. It was Ethan Hunt from Mission Impossible. And he has to do all these things that aren't difficult. They're impossible, right? Okay, Ethan, uh, here's your mission should you choose to accept it. I'm going to need you to dive into this watery vortex, swim down, um, find this particular computer key, swap out the computer key, and then swim out while holding your breath for the next hour and a half. I need you to do that. Says, well, that sounds hard. No, it's not hard, Ethan. It's impossible. Well, I'm your man. He dives in. But imagine it more like this. Okay, Trey, here's what we're going to need you to do. We're going to turn off the motor so the water stops swirling. Then we're going to need you to jump in. And then we're going to need you to kind of swim back out. That's your mission should you choose to accept it. And I say, I'm your man. I can do that. I can do that one. Maybe this will encourage you just a bit. Um, there was a theological giant of the uh, 19th century. His name was Karl Barth. He was a German theologian and um, really a big-brained guy when it came to thinking about God and the Bible. And he was on a lecture tour in the United States. 1962, he was at the University of Chicago, and he gave his lecture about these deep things that he'd learned about theology. And then it was time for Q&A, question and answer about um, anything. So this university students came forward asking questions. And this one student comes up and the student says, um, Dr. Barth, I have one question for you. Do you think you could summarize the essence of the Christian faith for us? So Carl Barth just paused for a moment and all the students were prepared with their notebooks, ready to be blown away, right, by this one, how do you summarize the essence of the Christian faith? Then everybody went quiet as the theologian said, yes, I can summarize the essence of the Christian faith in a song that I learned while I was at my mother's knee. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Is that a pretty simple message? God will either use it to save people or not people won't be saved. They'll either believe it or not. You can make it more complicated and more sophisticated and kind of water it down that way and mess up the message 
or you can keep it really simple. They're either going to respond to it or not. But we get this idea that, man, if I'd have just said that word, or if I'd have just said it that way, or if I'd have just added that joke, maybe they'd be saved today. That kind of stuff causes us doubts, doesn't it? So we end up not wanting to share Jesus with other people. But the message of all of 1 Corinthians 1 to 4 is it's a simple, simple message. And it's the hope. That's it. It's the hope. They'll either believe the simple message like children with childlike faith or they won't. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. He looked up from his crowds of blue-collar folks. That had, many of them had a difficult time reading at all. He looked up to Father God and he said, Father God, I want to thank you that you revealed these things to these babes. You know, the wise and the prudent, they don't get it, but you've revealed it to the children, to those with a simple faith who will believe on it or not. Right? These folks will believe on it. Their best chance is through a simple message. And the simpler it is, this is what we get from chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. The simpler it is, the more powerful it is. So some might say, I can do simple. I can do that. I want us to take just a moment to pray. And I want us to once again kind of ask with honesty, Father God, make me a fool for Christ by preaching heightened conversation with others about Jesus. Make me a fool for Christ. I'm the biggest fool of them all by preaching. All over the room, let's take a minute just to be quiet and pray. And We're going to sing in just a moment, but you just keep thinking and doing business with the Lord in prayer and just see what he says to you. Maybe he's going to give you a vision of how you can be a part of that. Maybe the foolishness that he wants you to jump into. Work towards. He's patient with us. He wants us to grow in this way. But all over the room, let's just pray and see how he might want to use preaching to make us even greater fools.